So, Senator, um, thanks for coming and doing this. Um, I want to do a, lick, a little bit more of a very quick, like, introductory. People are already wondering how the senators get put on the couch. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, we, but we won't do any flashcards or any Rorschach Good. tests. Good. Um, you have been in the Senate. You're the senior senator from Oregon. You've been in the Senate uh, since '96. Uh, you were on a bunch of really important committees, which uh, including the Budget Committee, the Finance Committee, um, the subcommittees on Health Care and Taxation. Uh, the Select Committee on Intelligence. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But the most important thing, I think, for our audience is that you're a, uh, a devoted member of the Senate Internet Caucus. And I, I was, we were just talking backstage. I can remember back in 1995 when you were still in the House uh, and the Communications Decency Act uh, came up before the Congress. Uh, you did something kind of historic and heroic, which was to get inserted into that bill uh, Section 230, which if I remember correctly, created safe harbor for user-generated content. And there are those who would say that if it wasn't for that, uh, we would not have the social web as we have it now. So I think you actually deserve a big a round of applause for most of the people in this room. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. For that in and of itself. I, I, I want to ask you a broad question about Washington and this world. Um, I, I picked up a quote of yours from the, from the web earlier today where you talked about back then, back in 95, you described your colleagues. You said back in the mid-1990s, much of the debate was defined by folks who were afraid of the new technology. They wanted to protect children from the scary internet. So tell me about your colleagues now. Are they still afraid of this technology, or is there another problem? Because clearly, there are still some problems. John, certainly it's changed tremendously. I mean, in effect, if you're a member of, of Congress and you want to keep up with your kid, you better know something about uh, a smartphone and, uh, and, and tweeting. But I would say that uh, there continue to be, be fears, and some of them are issues that we ought to deal with. For example, uh, lots of members of Congress are now much more reluctant to speak out in informal settings because they think somebody's going to hold up a, a, a cell phone, they're going to record everything they have, have to say. We have an iconic store in Oregon called Fred Meyer, and I'm walking through there all the time, picking up some apples, a, a box of cereal, and people just stop. You might be tired, it's uh, 9 o'clock at night, they pick up the phone and say, we'd like to record your view on X, X issue. So certainly things ha have changed, but uh, what I, I do like is that a mem member of Congress who is not literate in, in technology now, you can no longer call the internet a series of, of tubes and, and expect to... Uh, <laughs> to live to tell about it. And not be mocked for it sure. roundly. Um, there, I mean, there is, there's still a fair amount of ignorance, though, right? And there's also the issue, one of the issues that we can talk about as we talk about some of these issues more specifically, of the way in which money uh, devoted by, uh, money contributed by uh, certain industries that would like to retard some of the innovation, effectively retard some of the innovation in this world, uh, the way that money influences the, the way that the senators and members of the House behave. Is that, do you see that all the time? The content industry, for instance, and the way in which it, it donates so much money to members of, uh, of Congress, uh, does that, do you think that has a, a, a deleterious effect on, on keeping this realm as safe for innovation and progress as you'd like to see it? it? It's taking a toll, and one of the reasons I wanted to come today, and I'm going to be flying all night to get back for votes in, in the morning, is that I think particularly social media needs to understand what the threat is, the threat to innovation of some of these uh, uh, policies. And I hope I can get the, the message out there, everybody who's, uh, who's watching all, all this, is that we're going to have to fight back. And let me just go right to the question of uh, the so-called protect IP legislation, the question of intellectual uh, property. What this is at its heart is a question of whether one part of our economy, the content sector, can use government as a club to go after another part of our economy, which is the innovation sector and everything that the internet represents. The Protect IP Act, when you really strip it down, is about whether or not you're going to have arbitrary seizure of domains, whether or not you're going to have these vague standards for going in and, and seizing a domain, and then in something I think is particularly ominous, ceding a significant portion of the authority over the internet to private companies, in effect uh, allowing them to bring private rights of, uh, of action. So I have put a hold on this legislation. I'm the sponsor of the effort to get rid of these secret holds, so I announce everything publicly, because I think this legislation in its current form would take a significant toll on both freedom 
and innovation, and particularly now where the digital space is one of the most exciting parts of an economy where we've got some tough times. I don't want to let that happen. So for the sake of our audience who might not be following this that closely, there have been two versions of this bill, right? There was a Correct. version last year, the Combating Online Infringement and Counterfeits Act, C-O-I-C-A. I put a hold on that too. That legislation passed unanimously out of the relevant committee. You were effectively the, 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 the finger in the dike, right? I and mean, there was, th this had broad bipartisan support. T talk about what that law would have done, just in, 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 just in clear terms, what it, what it, enabled, what it would enabled uh, attorneys general and so on to do in terms of creating blacklisted internet sites. Well, the new version isn't particularly different okay. from the old version. Okay. So in terms of, of the, the substance... Uh, so we had the old version, which you put a hold on and effectively killed. Right. We now have a new version, which again you're putting a hold on. So now talk about what it does or the, what it would the, do. The, the, the new version is slightly you know, spruced up and people always try to come back and say, come on, Ron, aren't you against the theft of, of intellectual property? I mean, who wouldn't be? I mean, there's no question that we ought to take uh, uh, steps to, to deal with out-and-out uh, -out theft and counterfeiting and, and, and the like. But what this is, this is the equivalent of using a cluster bomb when you ought to go in there with a laser and the collateral damage to innovation and freedom. For example, some of the smartest people uh, in net tech technology, the engineers have said that one of the things that most concerns them about some of what is in this Protect IP Act is that it would do tremendous damage to linking and hyperlinking. Now, hyperlinking is the essence of the internet architecture. I mean, we ought to think very carefully about what, what we're doing here. And others have said that this Protect I, IP Act could actually harm responsible efforts at cybersecurity because some of what uh, is done kind of mimics what hackers do, and we're against hackers getting into domains. So the, the challenge now is to step back. If they were, for example, to narrow the definitions, you know, here in terms of what constitutes uh, intellectual property theft, and particularly get rid of that private right of, of action, which I think, you know, ceding authority over the internet to private companies, that's just breathtaking in terms of the possibilities for damage. So in terms of the way that this would actually work is the notion that, that, that there would be, if there, was, if there was a site that was accused of, of, of hosting material that infringed on copyrights. Accused, by the way, not found guilty, accused. Accused by a private company, accused by an attorney general, accused by law enforcement, accused by whomever it could effectively be put into a blacklisted category and, and essentially denied uh, its ability to be seen and accessed throughout the rest of the web. And of course, people are still going to be able to get at it because they can still get to the numerical um, way to access it as, as well and set it up under a different ki kind of name. It, at the end of the day, John, and, and I think this is going to be important, I see the internet as the shipping lane of the 21st century. It is going to be the way in which society is organized. It's going to be the way in which commerce is done. I am going to do everything I can to fight off efforts that would in some way wall off the Internet. That's what the net neutrality issue is all about. We've got to make sure that we have the freest and most open architecture possible in order to tap the opportunities that are available, particularly at a time when the economy needs innovation so desperately. So you mentioned net neutrality. The administration has tried to, has tried to move on that subject. We talked about that last year with, uh, with Chairman Janikowski. He was at this conference. What do you think of the administration's work so far in that area? I wish they were able to go a, a, a bit further. You know, this doesn't cover the wireless, but clearly this is a very solid step forward. I hope the court uh, uh, up upholds the, the judgments of the Federal Communications Commission. I think that's an iffy uh, proposition. And this is part of the fight back effort that I'd like to see those who are paying attention to what we're talking about to understand. By and large, folks in tech pretty much look at politics and the whole question of being in, involved in, in politics is not just prolonged root canal work, it's like being hospitalized for you know, months on end. People do not like you know, getting involved in the nuts and bolts of, of politics. But when uh, can, you, can you blame them? I, I, 
not even going to try to make that, that, that case. Yeah. But when the future of the social media is involved, you mentioned the, the question of what we did with the Communications Decency Act essentially 15 years ago. I'm not going to come before a group of good folks like this and say I invented the internet or something like that. You know, I, I, <laughs> I'm at the point in technology where I know what I don't know. And that's why I have a bunch of Cracker Jack 24 and 25 year old staffers to, you know, to help me through this. But what I do know is those decisions that we made back then with Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act and protecting intermediaries and protecting intermediaries the way uh, we, we did when people were saying, oh, you just got to go after them and, you know, and fight smut. That's one of the reasons why we have some of the best platforms developed in the world in the United States is we took steps to protect them, and I don't want to see us lose that. Let me ask you about another piece, a piece of legislation that you're actually sponsoring as opposed to something you're trying to stop from happening. Good. Um, the, the Geolocation Privacy and Surveillance Act that you're working on with, uh, with Congressman Chaffetz. Talk about that. Explain what that is. Well, it also is a little bit of an expression of technology politics and where, where they stand. Jason Chaffetz would probably tell you he's one of the most conservative Republicans in the House of Rep Representatives from the state of, and, of and Utah. He'd be, and he'd be right. And he'd be right. Yes. And what we have, have, have done is say, look, Millions of Americans are walking around with, uh, with a smartphone in their pocket. Your staff folks took mine away you know, from me, so I'm, I'm still feeling you know, like I've got to grab my, my, uh, my suit jacket. But the That's right. In terms of tracking, we know where you are. You, so. know, you know where I am. And you know, the, the, the point is, those Americans don't know that essentially private parties, private companies, government, and, and the like can essentially track them through their, their cell phone without any kind of rules of, of the road. So what Jason, Jason Chaffetz and I are saying is let's start with something simple and let's basically apply the Fourth Amendment in protecting people from unreasonable searches and, and, uh, and, uh, and seizures uh, as it relates to government. And if the government is going to track somebody other than in a small number of cases, emergency situations and the like, the government ought to have to go out and get a warrant before you track them and it applies to both the government and to private uh, parties and I think it's long overdue. Well this actually just opens up, <laughs> you may, yes you may applaud. Um, this actually opens up the question of another, another issue and, and it's sort of related in some ways is the question of the Patriot Act. You have been um, critical, you're, as I said before you're a member of the Intelligence Committee so you know some things that you can talk about and some things you can't talk about in front of this group but you've been critical of the administration. Uh, for a secret interpretation of portions of the Patriot Act that relate to, we think, warrantless wiretapping. And the fact that, I, th I believe your argument is that they, are, they have interpreted the law in secret in a way that is at variance with what most people think is the way the law actually operates. So explain your concern there. The New York Times is now suing the government over this very issue because they filed a FOIA request to try to find out about this question. The government said, no, we're not, we're not, we're not going to be governed by the, by, by the Freedom of Information Act here. We're going to keep this interpretation secret. An interpretation of the law, they're claiming, is now a classified matter. It's rather strange. Tell, tell me about your concerns here. What do you think is going on and how important it is to get to the bottom of it? John, I serve on the Senate Select Committee on, on Intelligence. My, uh, my older daughter calls it the so-called intelligence uh, committee. <laughs> and obviously I can't get into anything classified, but let me kind of strip down what this whole question is all about. I believe very strongly that there are two Patriot Acts in America. There is the Patriot Act that you can, you can pull up on your uh, iPad. It is a public law. You can see it on uh, various ki kinds of websites. That's the Patriot Act that most Americans are familiar with and that they see in as a public document. There is another Patriot Act, which essentially is the secret interpretation that the executive branch uses to offer up their belief of what the law actually means and how they are car carrying it out. And I have said that I believe that when the American people see what the secret interpretation is. And remember, this always comes out. I mean, the history of all this is you think something's secret, it's going to come, come to light at some point. I think people are going to be surprised, and I think, uh, I think they're going to be angry when they see the gap between what is a public law and how it's secretly being interpreted. And let me just use intelligence speak for a moment. 
it's very important in the intelligence world that you protect what's called sources and methods. These are the people, they're you know, wonderfully patriotic you know, Americans who are doing good work to ensure the well-being of everybody who's in this, this audience and paying attention to the, these issues. Let's protect that. And I don't take a backseat to anybody in terms of protecting sources and methods. But the interpretation of a law, how it is actually being carried out, that ought to be public. The American people ought to have that information so they can debate it. And I'm very pleased that the New York Times has filed suit to get it. So let me, so, so let me, let me paraphrase something for you and, and, and see if, uh, in the context of, your, of, of what you can say and what you can't say, whether, the, whether you will um, object to, to my paraphrase of what I think you're saying. What I think you're saying is that the secret interpretation of the Patriot Act is being employed to allow the government to do a lot more warrantless wiretapping than we think it is currently doing. Is that fair? I, I can't come close to answering that question. But if I were to... And, 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 being, and being in line, line with the rules, well, the way... And, and I'm frustrated by it because I'd, I'd love to be able to lay this out for the, for the audience, but, you know, it's essentially against the, the let's, law. Let's do, it, let's, do it, let's do it this way, all right? You, you, I'm going to say a sentence, okay? And, 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 we're, and we're friends. This is why, friends. This is why you're all going to go get the next edition of Game Change. Right. But we're he, is a, he is a tough journalist who doesn't give up. We're friends. You would never let me say something to this group of people that was demonstrably wrong, right? So, so I'll just assume if you don't say anything, we'll just assume that what I say is true. How about that? How's that work, okay? So the, the government, under its secret interpretation of the Patriot Act, is doing a lot more warrantless wiretapping than we think. Okay. So I'll take that as a yes. I am, I am so glad that I am not running for president and subject <laughs> to, to this, this kind of thing. Here, here's, here's the other, other point with respect to the Patriot Act that, that's so important yeah. and why the public needs the secret interpretation that I am, particularly Senator Mark Udall, who's been a wonderful ally yeah. and I, are trying to get at. A big part of the debate with respect to privacy and indivi individual uh, liberty is based on the proposition that some would like to say to the American people, look, you can have one or the other. You can either be protected from dangerous terrorists or you can have the so-called privacy rights that you know, people like me are working for. I don't buy that at all. I don't buy the, that idea. I do not think that these are mutually exclusive. I think it's possible to fight terrorism ferociously and still make sure that people you know, who are listening you know, here can have, have, uh, have their privacy and, and do what Ben, uh, ben Franklin ba basically said, is recognize that if you didn't you know, focus on privacy, you didn't even deserve your, your security. We can have both, and that's why the American people ought to be able to see this secret interpretation. And Mark Udall and I, and, and now the New York Times, are going to stay after this. Let me ask you one more, uh, let me ask you one more, just a quick follow-up on this question. So, you know, a lot of the abuses of, uh, for instance, the Patriot Act, and, and in the context of warrantless wiretapping, a lot of those things were, uh, they were attributed to, correctly, the Bush administration. And many Democrats in this room, many people, members of your party, uh, said, hey, you know, when Barack Obama gets in office, that's all going to get fixed because he's a great guy, you know, and he's not George Bush. He's not going to do any of these things. It seems to me like you're saying that there's been an extension, a continuation, a certain consistency, in fact, in the policy that this administration, a Democratic administration, I will remind you, has pursued. Is there really a dime's worth of difference between Barack Obama and George Bush on this issue? Oh, I, I think on a host of, of important issues, both here and, that, and uh, that have international ramifications. I mean, he came right in and abolished torture and, and the but like. On, but, on, but on this issue? Let's put it this way. I had hoped that we would make more progress. But I think that as the public sees what's at issue here, they're going to respond. I mean, the fact, fact of the matter is, look at what, what, uh, what you see in the debate right now with respect to, to the economy. I mean, the American people, with respect to Wall Street bailouts, two of the most important votes I've cast in my time in public service, I voted against both of those Wall Street bailouts because I think we're moving to a system, and you see it in Too Big to Fail, where the big and powerful get bailed out and everybody else has got to fend for themselves, and they're going to respond. Let me ask you a question. There's, uh, uh, as you and everyone in this room, and everyone in the world knows, Steve Jobs is passing a, a, a terrible, uh, sad, tragic uh, moment for, for this valley and for, and for the industry. 
uh, and in a lot of ways for American innovation uh, writ large. Um, there was a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the response to that in, the, in that week after he passed. Um, there was a lot of question raised about how, how fair is American entrepreneurship. In this room, uh, most of the people sitting here are entrepreneurs. In this valley, most of the people here are either, either entrepreneurs doing something that supports entrepreneurship. But there is a broader set of concerns about entrepreneurship around the country, um, around whether uh, the, the rates of entrepreneurship, new company formation, uh, all of those things are in fact in, in, a, in a gradual and kind of worrying state of secular decline in a lot of other places in this country. Do you worry about that? Is that something that concerns you? And to the extent that it concerns you, what should the government be doing to foster and promote entrepreneurship, if anything, in America? You know, I, I, th I think, John, this is the overriding issue of our time. I mean, if you accept the view that the unemployment situation we're seeing today is structural, this is not like the business cycle. And I'm older than a lot of folks here in the audience, but we remember that unemployment was largely the business cycle. Something would go wrong with weather, something of that, that nature, and then eight, nine, you know, ten months later, thing, things would pick up. This is a structural kind, kind of challenge, and there are a whole host of, of issues, and right at the heart is what we do to promote innovation. And one of the reasons that I have fought so hard for legislation like Section 230, uh, we didn't get into, into it here, I wrote the Internet uh, Tax Freedom Bill to limit uh, arbitrary taxes against net-based commerce. Now we're going to extend it to digital, you know, digital goods. I mean, it seems to me that if you're going to uh, socket, you know, to, you know, to iTunes, but not do it to a physical good like a, a CD, that's not a sensible policy for innovation in the digital kind of space. I'm trying to get the Obama administration to lock in permanently. I chair the subcommittee, uh, the finance subcommittee on international trade. I want to make as a permanent part of all trade negotiations, trying to knock down barriers to our getting digital goods in every market in the world. This is a natural, you know, for us. Now, it's cloud computing, it's a whole host of, of uh, products and services that we've got the lead in, but we have got to innovate. Uh, it involves taxes, it involves regulation, as you know, because you've covered it. Dan Coates and I have the first bipartisan tax reform bill in a quarter century. One of the areas we change is for small business, they could write off the cost of a new piece of technology on day one. On day one, they could write it off you know, permanently, so there'd be some certainty and predictability when they uh, took the risk and, and bought that equipment to, to innovate. So this is the overriding uh, challenge, in my view, of the, our economic comeback. Well, do, do you think, though, that, that those are all great answers to what the government should be doing to promote, as I asked, but do you, do you have, like, at the top of that question, are you worried about the state of entrepreneurship yes. in America? Yes. I mean, do you see that you feel like in your, you've been in Congress a long time now, do you feel like you sense that, whether it's in, in Oregon or around the country, because you travel around a lot, do you sense that there's been, that there's some kind of an ebbing in the animal spirits that have created a lot of America's great uh, new companies over the last 20 or 30 years? I, I think it is more a sense of pessimism about can Washington, D.C. get its act together and pass some policies that will liberate you know, the innovators. I went to see a, a very conservative member of the House uh, a couple of days ago to talk about some opportunities to totally transform the unemployment system in our, in our country. You know, we've got this system that just locks people in the week after week after week, 90 weeks, 99 weeks, the, the, the whole thing. I'd like to revise the unemployment uh, system in our country to make it a trampoline for entrepreneurship. We've had a number of really exciting uh, businesses, you know, develop in Oregon. Already we were able to get it in as a pilot project where people who could come up with a business plan, understood something about mobile apps and, and, and the like. Um, we've got some really exciting businesses getting off the ground because they were able to do more than just take their you know, un unemployment check and, and go to a, a training program where, where folks uh, didn't have the skills they do and couldn't uh, use their own, own energy. So to me, A, it's as serious as your question you know, suggests, and I think what the American people are most troubled by is whether or not their Congress, whether or not their elected officials can get their act together and pass the kinds of policies we're talking about, you know, here today. And we're going to go on to, to other ones. You know, we're looking right now at some of the cloud 
uh, computing you know, issues. There are already questions with respect to, to data, what the rules ought to, ought to be for a promising new technology. I'm trying to look at a smart you know, uh, policy that might deal with congestion of the networks and, and the like. So there are plenty of opportunities here for innovation and I think entrepreneurs who want to tap those opportunities. Now what we need is a government that gets its act together and lets people have those uh, possibilities. Let me ask you one last question, and then I actually want to ask to see if there's some questions out in the audience, um, just because it's so much in the news and you were talking about frustration. Uh, Occupy Wall Street um, and the Occupy Everything movement that's now gone global. It's extraordinary how fast in the span of a month now it's, it is worldwide. Um, there was a, I had stopped on the street just the other day. There was a march down Market Street um, here a couple days ago in San Francisco. Um, pro or con, good, good, a good thing? that this is taking the form it's taking, that there's this popular unrest about the financialization of our, our economy, about the degree of uh, inequality in our economy, about the bailouts of, of the financial sector uh, when no one else has gotten bailed out. Is that, a, is, that, is that something that can be channeled into a positive outcome, or is this a, a going to end up being a counterproductive uh, days of rage kind of phenomenon that's going to pass away without not doing very much in a couple weeks from now? My, my major takeaway from what, what we've seen is whether or not you're sitting around your kitchen you know, table now, you know, tonight people heading home for dinner or some, something like that, talking about their day, or whether you're going to a protest. Those people at the kitchen table or at a protest are saying, this economy is not working for us. It is not working for us. It is Wall Street bailouts. It's tax policy that favors shipping jobs overseas. It's uh, policies that we've just talked about that would chill in innovation, restrict the kind of freedom that has always made us the, the leaders. I mean, we touched on this question of Section 2, 230. If we hadn't been able to get that passed, would some of these platforms have developed? I don't think so. So, you know, to me, Everybody that I bump bump into is practically the part is practically part of a protest movement today because they are that you know angry and people who are going to be on the ballot in the in the fall of 2012 better get get that message. All right, let's see if there's some questions out here in the audience for you, um, Senator. I think it's fair to say that uh, unlike almost everybody else in Washington, you actually have some brains. So um, <laughs> let's um, let's try to tap into those from uh, someone out here in the uh, in the crowd. Um, I, I told I told John on technology. When he said, you seem to know a fair amount about this, I said, my contribution is I know what I don't know, which is an enormous amount, and that's why I have all these 25-year-old staffers to help. All right, right over here. Hi, um, I'm, I'm the head of a program for Startup Chile. We attract, uh, we attract entrepreneurs from all over the world to start their businesses in Chile. We actually issue visas within a week while they're in Chile. What are, what, are, what are your thoughts about immigration and how that will uh, empower others to, to be entrepreneurs? Two, two points, one in terms of the short term and, and uh, one in terms of broader immigration uh, policy. I believe we've got to find a way to say as public policy that if someone from thousands of miles from American shores comes and gets educated at American expense and wants to set up a promising, innovative you know, firm here, they ought to have a chance to do that. And we've got to find a way to make changes in the immigration rules to allow that. So that's number one. Number two, in terms of policy, I think, by and large, George W. Bush and Ted Kennedy got it right in terms of immigration policy. What they uh, said was, you know, on a date certain, as part of a bipartisan you know, reform effort, you were going to strengthen the controls at the, at the borders. You were going to enforce the, the laws on the books. You were going to say that people who were here undocumented, people who were illegally, were going to have to pay, face some kind of penalty or, or, or fine. But if they had broken you know, no other laws and mastered English, they should have the capacity to go to the end of the line and uh, apply for citizenship. I thought it made sense then. I think it makes sense now. I think the Congress was wrong back before the 2008 election to completely duck it. And by the way, and I don't know if that was in game change, but I'm going to go back and look. In the 2008 campaign, there were three major debates, 90 minutes each. Because the Congress had ducked the immigration issue, not one question was asked in those three debates about immigration. We cannot let that happen again. We absolutely have to have immigration reform. Yes, sir. Yes, Michael Golden with the New York Times Company. First, thank you for your nice comments about the Times. 
Um, it can, you can make a very good argument that the European Union is far ahead of the U.S. in terms of antitrust, in terms of consumer protection, and in terms of privacy. Um, they stopped Google with some of the Google mapping on privacy, limited severely what telephone companies can charge for roaming charges and texting to put it in line with economics. Um, and the antitrust also. Do you feel that they're on the right road? Is, are they ahead of us? Are they on a road that's divergent? Um, do you study what they're doing? What's your view of, of where the EU is in comparison to the US? I, I do study what, what they're, they're up to. And, and we saw this also in the context of the healthcare debate and, 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 and the like. I think while we ought to study it, and we all, always ought to look at best practices, I think there's limited applicability because we have to come up with uniquely American you know, approaches. And I've mentioned the very significant array of new companies that, that came about, in, in my view, because we helped to strengthen the role of the ISPs and the intermediaries and the like. And by the way, we better keep doing that. I've already sent a letter to the president. I'm very troubled about ACTA and some of the implications there. This is this new um, so-called you know, treaty that could, in effect, have additional you know, restrictions put on the intermediaries and forcing the police that, you know, the internet. So uh, I don't want us to trade our system for, for anybody else's. Let's always look at, 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 uh, at be best practices. And I think it's noteworthy that the exciting companies, particularly in the social medium space, disproportionately have come to the United States. We're doing a lot of things right. OK. Let's go over here. Senator. So uh, you, you paraphrased the uh, famous comment uh, you know, that, that information wants to be free. Uh, and I don't think anyone would argue with that. Uh, I, I think you could also make the point that, uh, that information has value, especially if in, in aggregate. And people get very annoyed when that information gets given away without them getting something for it. Uh, and that's led many states to pass laws you know, about protecting personally identifying information. And you know, the federal government has passed you know, HIPAA and other legislation. How do we ultimately craft some kind of a redress for people who perceive that something of value has been taken from them that might be difficult to monetize in some direct way? If you know, my medical information gets you know, sold uh, to some company, uh, that has, I'm annoyed because I wanted something for that information. Uh, I don't mind giving it to my doctor in exchange for health care. But yeah, what's it worth? And how do I get right redress in a court of law? And, and what, what role should the federal government have in helping that sort of thing? We're going to have a program to, tomorrow. That's what I'm going to be flying all, all night to get back on, essentially looking back at, at the law that was written 25 years ago on, 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 on privacy. And, and the staff people that I'm, I'm going to be taking to the program tomorrow are um, the law is older than they are. So clearly, we have got to update it. And here's the way I'm going to uh, start. With all of this data being aggregated and commoditized and essentially being sold to, to people, and uh, folks have no idea what's being sold. Suddenly, they get an email from somebody, or you know, they get snail mail from some outfit that was related to a purchase that they made you know, a year ago. They don't have any sense of of what the uh, rules are. So we need a new set of rules of the road with respect you know, to privacy. The centerpiece of it should be, in some way, people controlling their own data. They should have to give explicit permission for it to be sold and used and spliced up and diced up and all the things that uh, have gone on with, uh, with, with derivatives. And if that's not done, and we ought to explicitly lay it out in a new updated uh, policy that we'll be talk talking about tomorrow, there ought to be, you know, be penalties. Now, I'm not prepared to say whether monetary or this or that or something else, but I think that, that ought to be you know, the focus of updating a 25-year-old law. OK, this is, this is a quick question or a long question? Uh, I can make it quick. Quick. OK, quick. Uh, so innovation, last one. Sorry, in, innovation requires Sorry. Uh, allowing species, the, the youngsters, to, to, uh, to, start to, to grow and, and expand. Um, the, right now, the, the Supreme Court has said that 
corporations can have as much free speech as they want, which is a, akin to saying that dinosaurs can dictate what the evolutionary trajectory is. Is there anything we can do to stop that corporate free speech and, and prevent corporations from thus preventing innovation? Such a great, great point. Let me give you an example of just uh, a couple of days ago. I was uh, in Central Oregon. I hope everybody vacations at some point in Sun River in beautiful cent Central Oregon. We had a big um, dinner uh, over there, and as is always the case, you pass the, the hat, and the folks are get up there and saying, who will give $25, and who will give $50, and who will give $75? We did that probably for half hour, 45 minutes. My colleague uh, in the Senate, Jeff Merkley, did a terrific job and had everybody you know, howling. And all I could think about, and I sat next to Cecile uh, Richards, you know, who is the head of Planned you know, Parenthood, a wonderful uh, advocate for, for women and, and something I feel very strongly about. And I turned to somebody who was sitting with me and I said, you know, the big powerful folks can raise a hundred times with three phone calls what we have just raised, you know, here, here tonight in terms, of, in terms of the overall effort. I think that Citizens United basically took the doors off the democratic, you know, process. I mean, I don't know any other way, you know, to describe it. I'm, I'm the sponsor of something called Stand By Your Ad, which means if John's running uh, for the United States Congress, he's got to look in the camera and say, I'm John Hallman, I'm running you know, for the United States Congress. The idea that some powerful special interest, and it ought to apply across the board, business, labor, you name it, doesn't even have to identify themselves when they're spending these enormous sums, I just think is a moral you know, blot. So we ought to start there and uh, try to bring, bring some democracy in elections back to our democracy. <laughs> um. Senator, apart, apart from that hypothetical about me running for Congress, not everything you said was smart. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, John Battelle is going to come back up because he's right here behind us. Thank you. That was a great conversation. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much.